So the very first talk is um, efficient similarity computation for data filtering in dynamic environments. And our speaker is Olivier Yonan, and this is his first talk. Um, so to set the scene, uh, we're going to be talking about dealing with a uh, data set containing of implicit feedback. So you have basically user item and timestamp triplets, um, and these can be clicks or views or sales or whatever you want. So we will call them a set of page views in this. Time. Then in neighborhood-based collaborative filtering, you actually want to compute the similarity between these pairs of items. Now, in this user, um, these items can be represented as sparse high-dimensional vectors in the user item matrix as, as shown here. So when you're going to try to compute this, um, it's actually going to take a while because most of, um, it's going to take a while because we have pretty large data sets most of the time. And when you're getting more and more and more data, it's going to take a longer and longer. And basically, if your model is going to take two hours to compute, you're always going to be running two hours behind. So you always want to um, be able to do this actually as fast as possible. And most of the um, existing approaches to do this, they actually rely pretty often on approximations. Uh, which is sometimes not something you would want. You would really want to know what is the exact similarity they actually have. You can do it in Pedal um, or online or many things. Um, but most of the actual existing approaches for doing this in an exact manner don't exploit the fact that your data is super sparse. And we can actually really use that to, to make a difference. Um, so, first of all, one thing that's actually pretty simple is if your data is binary, so you just have zeros and ones, the ghost and similarity actually reduces to the number of items that have seen, um, the number of users that have seen a certain item I, and the number of users that have seen a certain item J. So you have the number of users that have seen both divided by the square roots of their individual counts. And instead of always recomputing the ghost and similarity, you can actually just use these building blocks. So we're going to try to compute um, the co occurrence matrix, which is M, and just the vector of counts, which is N. Then uh, when we have this, you can uh, then actually always get the ghost and similarity out of this. So um, one more thing: most of the approaches that exist actually use an inverted index because it's a, it's a very fast way to do the They will always tend to build this in a pre-processing step. Um, uh, there's actually no need to do this. You can just build this um, sort of dynamic index when you're when you're looking over your, your data. So we just have an inverted index for every user. Uh, it's going to start off empty. When you see a new page view, so that's the user in the item here, you're just going to look at all of the items that have been seen by the same user beforehand. You're going to do a small increment of the item for occurrence in your matrix. You have to count the fact that you saw the item, and then you add the item to the user's inverted index. And that's basically all there is to it for the first very simple step. Now, what is nice about this is actually the fact that it's a single for loop over your data. So there's it's sort of, it, it can very naturally handle streaming data. So if you have new page views coming in, you can just sort of throw a your algorithm and you're just sort of doing this always in a sort of incremental manner. And you will always have something entirely up to date. So just as a small example, if you would at a certain point in time need TI time to actually compute your model, you get some new data, then you have more data, so it's going to take longer to beat TI plus one time. Well, with, an, um, with a model like this, um, you basically only need delta T time, which is going to save you a lot of time. Um, what's also nice about this is it's actually pretty easy to do it in a, um, in a memory use way. So if you would just look at um, the co occurrence matrix, the gamma vector, and the inverted index as the output of a map procedure. Then the, uh, the, uh, the procedure for uh, reducing two models actually becomes pretty simple. You just have to sum up um, the matrices that you have and the vectors that you have. And then you have to look at okay, I have a um, basically half of the history of a certain user in one model, half of the history of the certain user in a different model. Then you have to start sort of doing all, all the cross referencing for co occurrences. But if you can make sure that all of your map processes get data from disjoint sets of users, you don't have to do this step too, and it actually becomes very, very fast. Um, and as a final observation, um, actually, we don't really need to have all of these item similarities. It's going to happen pretty often. 
that there's actually a set of items that you're not going to recommend anyway. Think about news where you might not want to show uh, something that actually happened two years ago, um, or seasonality, or, or stock, or something like that. Many, many uh, of these examples. Um, so when you have actually a smaller set of items that is recommendable, um, you don't need to have the similarity if two pairs of items are not in that set. And we're going to, to be exploring that as well. Um, so to the experimental results, uh, we use MovieLens and Netflix uh, in news data set and uh, a subset of the outbrain data set. MovieLens and Netflix are of course rating data sets, but we might not use them. Um, then, yeah, so they are all pretty big, so they range from 20 million to 200 million events or page views uh, with a large number of users and items. They are all pretty sparse, as you can see there's wide ranges in, for example, the, the mean length of user history. So if we just look at the runtime on single cores, uh, when we assume the entire item catalog is actually uh, going to be recommendable, um, you can see that we're, we're better than a baseline that was also uh, tuned for the sparse setting. Um, there's more information about this, this baseline in the paper, if you want. Um, you can see for the movie lens data set, we're actually not that much faster, but we do have the advantage that are all actually going to use this all in a sort of incremental way. So if you would have to recompute it halfway through, we would only need that delta t, whereas the baseline would have to be recomputed from scratch. Um, so some of the main observations that we had is this is uh, actually very, very efficient if, um, if the co-occurrence matrix is sparse. It doesn't really matter if your user item matrix is sparse, but if most of the co-occurrences are zero, the similarities are going to be zero, then that's really something you can exploit. It's also way more efficient if users have short histories, because most of what we do is actually looking over, um, is actually looking over those inverted images. And if they are short, then that's also going to be faster. Um, and we can thus have on a single core in the range of a few hundred thousand user item interactions that we can process per second. So what happens if we have multiple cores? Well, it actually also seems to scale pretty well. Uh, so here we have results for one core, two, four, and eight. Uh, and it's not exactly linear. Uh, and you do see that when you're adding more and more cores, you get uh, smaller uh, gains. But still, it, it looks pretty nice. So for the news in the Netflix data sets, we actually have a speed of factor of more than four compared to, to the, the single core. Um, now, it is worth mentioning, if you are going to do this in parallel, you also want to make use of the fact that it computes everything online, you have to think about your batch size. So, of course, if your batch size is very, very small, there is some overhead in doing the mapping use procedure, and then it is going to, to actually be worse than doing it. Um, then finally, um, well, um, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, for a news recommendation, for example, you will basically always have this, this fact that not all of your items are going to be uh, actually part of the recommendable sets. You want to show stuff that actually happened recently. So if you look at a recent sort of time window of like delta, delta being from six hours to a day to two days to a week or to infinity, um, then it actually makes sense to just compute the similarities needed to be able to recommend stuff out of that set. So we can see that. For this delta, it's actually a nice way to be able to tune how fast our algorithm is. Um, so we need, for example, we need less than 10% of the runtime um, when we look at uh, all the new items for the last two days. Uh, it's really it's a nice way to sort of try and tune how, how fast you can go without losing anything because we're still going to be able to recommend some use. Um, and we also see that the, the slope actually flattens a little bit, so it also becomes more scalable as you get more and more data. So to conclude, uh, we introduce dynamic index, which is a fast way to compute exact similarities between sparse high-dimensional vectors. Uh, it's very easy to do it in an online manner. It's very easy to do it in parallel. Uh, and it can also naturally handle and exploit uh, the recommendability of items. Uh, the source code is available online. We are also hiring, uh, and I would be happy to take some questions. Questions? Hi, uh, nice work. Uh, I was wondering if you looked uh, at um, the neighborhood uh, computation uh, in a similar fashion that you uh, compute similarities incrementally. 
then you typically the next step is to compute the neighborhoods. So I was wondering if you would like to do that. Well, um, the neighborhoods are a little bit different thing. The, the main issue you have there is that if you want to keep your top A, you want to do it in a sort of incremental manner, you're always going to want to know what your, your second uh, um, you basically want to know what your, your k plus first neighbor was, because when you have new data, it might sort of juggle everything up. Um, so it's certainly something to look into, but it's just not something we've done. Uh, I have a question for the performance. Could you comment on why the two uh, several different data sets have different high performance as you're scaling them? Right, right. Um, so if we could go back to the slide. You mean single core or? Uh, both, like for example, why is Movilance kind of stay close while our brain um, right. a lot more gain? Um, so I think it's, it's mostly due to the sparsity of the data. Um, so we really, we, we won't go and compute something if there's no zero. I mean, um, of course, it's also the same thing for the baseline. Um, but I think one of the main gains is the fact that, for example, in the data set uh, for, uh, for outbrain, um, on the average, users have seen less than two items in So you have a really short inverted index and you actually never have to loop over that. And then it's going to be it's going to be much faster. Whereas if your users have a pretty long history, um, then you have a pretty long inverted index and that's going to actually take up most of your computation time. Okay. Uh, we actually have a question from the overflow room. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All the student volunteers. Here's your chance. Please. Is it working? Yes. yes. Thank you. So, uh, thank you for the talk. It was very good. Um, unfortunately, I came a bit late. However, I arrived to a slide when you mentioned you want to keep or you look to only some items. So, you are not keeping all the items. So, let's say those items are called critical. How can you find these items? Are they the most popular ones, the most rated, or are you um, doing something in your algorithm to catch those critical items? Um, well, so basically the sets can be whatever you want it to be. Um, if you're doing news recommendation, it's probably going to be the most recent items, but if you're in retail, it might just be what's currently in stock. Um, and there's more information about that in the paper, but you can, you can basically, the set can be any subset of your, your entire item collection, or even just the entire item collection. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, let's thank our speaker.